And when you can value your own time and see that your time and energy are finite, like you said, you only have so much of a, of a battery, you have 24 hours. How much of that are you going to give away? You're listening to Make Some Noise podcast, episode number 447 with guest Laura Danger. Welcome to Make Some Noise Podcast, your guide for strategies, tools, and insight to empower yourself. I'm your host, Andrea Owen, global speaker, entrepreneur, life coach since 2007, and author of three books that have been translated into 18 languages and are available in 22 countries. Each week, I'll bring you a guest or a lesson that will help you maximize unshakable confidence, master resilience, and make some noise in your life. You ready? Let's go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. I am so glad that you are here. We are moving into our relationships theme on the podcast. We're going to be talking about romantic relationships, friendships, really any kind of relationship because we're all in them. And I wanted to start out with a guest today. Laura Danger is our guest. And I found her on TikTok, of course. And she – well, she'll tell you about the work that she does, but what hooked me uh, in her work is she she explains very – oh, I don't even know how to describe it. I'm not going to describe it well. <laughs> she does a really great job of explaining the division of labor, whether it's the division of labor in relationships or the division of labor at work. She does mostly talk about relationships, but don't turn this off if you are single because – I think her advice is helpful to really anyone. And if you are ever in a relationship, uh, especially in a in a heterosexual relationship where our gender roles have been kind of taught to us either explicitly or implicitly since we were young, then Laura is going to be the person that you're going to want to listen to uh, about this particular topic. Also, if you haven't already checked out my retreat that I'm hosting in September, I am so excited about it. The um, It's The Daring Way. It's the methodology based on the research of Brene Brown. And it's in Asheville, North Carolina. It's going to be amazing out in the mountains out there. We're renting one big house. And it's at andreaowen.com slash retreat. If you are on the fence, and is because it's a big deal. I totally get it. And I want to make sure that you're making the decision from a place of just knowing that it's an absolute yes. So if you're on the fence and you want to jump on like a 15 or 20 minute call with me, I am opening up my schedule to take some of those for people who are interested in the retreat and want their questions answered and just kind of want to do a gut check. So the retreat is at andreaowen.com slash retreat easy to find. And if you do want to have a quick call with me, just shoot us an email, support at andreaowen.com, and we'll get that all set up for you. I'm really excited about it, and I hope that you check it out and see if it's a good fit for you. All right, so let's get on with today's show. Oh, real quick, before I forget, oh my gosh, I finally posted about our new puppy on Instagram. If you follow me on Instagram, you may have seen it. If you follow me on Instagram, you maybe didn't see it because the algorithm is terrible. (laughs) But it's in one of my most recent reels. You can see her, and I'm definitely going to be posting her in my stories. I will have a highlight just for her. She's still a puppy. It is joyously exhausting. I'll just say that. It's joyously exhausting. She is just a complete delight to have, and we're just over the moon in love with her. Her name is Astrid. Astrid the Wonder Dog. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about our guest today. Laura Danger is an educator and an advocate. Danger unapologetically champions for equitable division of labor at home and in the workplace. She raises awareness of the insidious undervaluing of care and empowers domestic engineers to fight back. So without further ado, here is Laura. Laura, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to have this conversation. I've been following you on TikTok for a minute. You must have come across my my for you page in the beginning when I when I first downloaded it and this topic is so incredibly important. So I want to jump right in. Let's let's to not scare anyone because I <laughs> by scare anyone, because I know you can get very specific and you don't, 
mince words. It's like one of the things I really like about you. Uh Um, Not that you're going to be mean, but just, I think it throws people for a loop sometimes who are brand new to the topic. So let's, let's start and just tell us what the fair play method is. Sure. Um, So I came to the fair play method around November of 2019. It's a book written by author, New York uh, Times bestselling author, Eve Rodsky. And um, she's an organizational manager. She's Harvard trained. She's, she's an incredible person. Um, But this it's a system. It's a framework for uh, partnerships, or even if you are at work, any sort of system where you are in a close proximity, working with somebody you care about. Um, And it's to distribute mental labor and actually bring to light the invisible labor that we so often use to build resentments at home. Mm -hmm. Okay. I didn't know that she also wrote the book from a place of, you know, you can use the system at work as well. I thought it was just for relationships. It's the book is written in, um, in a way that it fits very well with couples. And she uses a lot of language around and, uh, partnerships, but I personally have had most of my experience with things like weaponized incompetence at work. So I have actually implemented some of, excuse me, some of this outside just intimate partnership. Okay. So we definitely will, are going to have people listening who are not in relationships, um, but who can, who will, their ears will perk up when they're thinking about work scenarios. I am sure with any coworkers, any, any gender. So ha- tell us, can it give us like the basics of it and how does it help couples and people at work? So I think the light bulb moment for me when I first started using the system was the idea of CPE and minimum standard of care. Mm -hmm. So CPE means the conception, the planning and the execution of a task. Right. And, um, she did it. It's basically like three different compartments of the task. It's not just the task itself. Exactly. Exactly that. So when I'm thinking about laundry, um, you know, previous to me finding this system, I was like, yeah, oh, my husband and I both do the laundry. You know, he puts it in there and then takes it out and, or like brings it upstairs. But there are so many other pieces to that, right? Like what, in your mind, what do you think of when you do laundry? Well, you have to think about, you know, as someone who has done the majority of the laundry, I'm always thinking about the inventory of it. You know, it's like (laughs) when it's stacking up, Or is there a particular child in my house that needs some kind of uniform or their favorite jacket that needs to be washed during a certain time? Like, I think those are the things that I, you know, when I was younger and I didn't do laundry that I never knew were part of the quote unquote laundry task. Absolutely. That's such a good point. And I do workshops on this and that's always the example I use because I have a daughter who like every Sunday needs to wear the same LOL doll dress. And if you don't have it, she gets really, really mad and it ruins our Saturday. (laughs) Mm. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so continue. Exactly. Like you said, like the parts that you're talking about are the conception or even Mm -hmm. understanding what needs to happen. It's that part that, um, you know, this is a gendered issue. Domestic Mm -hmm. labor is not a gendered thing, but it presents socially as a gendered issue often. Um, and And it happens in queer couples too. But, um, so a lot of times like women are doing this, this anticipation of family needs or even at work. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that's what the system does is brings to light that, that the conception is part of the mental load. And then the planning piece is like you said, when does it need to get done? Do I have time? Am I going to be able to get the load setting the timer? I need to make sure that I have 45 minutes for that because it's a hot, you have to wash it on hot. Do I have all of the supplies? And then the execution piece is like one third of the entire task. That's the easy part. (laughs) Totally. Like, would you rather be the manager of your household every bit, or would you rather have someone tell you what to do and just pull it off? A lot easier to have somebody tell you what to do. Totally. Totally. Mentally. I, I, So I I recently wrote a book that came out last summer called Make Some Noise. And I I talk about how one of the themes is that as women and as young girls were raised 
to, you know, social programming is that it is our job to make everyone else comfortable. Um, and we do not cause a ruckus. We don't speak up and we, you know, we put everyone else's comfort before ours. And, you know, I can relate to, and I didn't really, I I think in my first marriage, we didn't have children, but I definitely, oh my God, the feminist in me like wants to throw up when I say this, but like, I would pack for him. Like if we would go on a trip, um, I would, Uh I just pretty much did everything partly because it made me a little bit bananas because he would wait till the last minute and he would complain about it. And, and so I'm like, Oh, let me just do it. It's just easier. Yeah. But again, we did not have children when I had, when I had children, um, we started out the, the marriage where I stayed home. And then I started a business right when my kids were babies, which is like another story for another time, the conflict that that caused. And, uh-huh. um, I still ended up doing the majority of, of the load. And I, I remember one time this was not, okay. I'm going to give you an example of how not to fix this problem. (laughs) And I'm sure that you have heard this story. (laughs) I got so mad one day I wrote a list of all of the things that I am responsible for in the house. And then I wrote a list of all things my husband was responsible for. He was responsible for, I mean, I could definitely count on one hand how many things that, that, that he had from conception to completion, which was like Uh the yard. Um, and I think that car maintenance, that was, uh-huh. that was, that's the only two things I can think of. And I, I mean, everything down to who, who gets the Halloween costumes for our children, right? <laughs> who, who, um, RSVPs for the birthday parties and makes sure that, you know, what kind of gift the child would like and getting it wrapped. And my husband had no idea that I did a lot of these things. And he's, we got into this big argument about it. And he said, uh-huh give me some of those tasks. And Uh I, I paused and like my first thought, Laura was, but you're going to fail at them. Uh Uh-huh. And it affects my children. Yep. So I don't want to do it to you. I don't want to give it to you. So is that a common? (laughs) Oh, a hundred percent. Like it's, you you know, what's so amazing is the first thing you said was like, it makes you want to puke thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that is like, I wish I could just shout that from the rooftops because so many of us who feel like you're like the feminist in me, we have been raised that we don't need anyone to right. tell. We don't need anyone. I'm going to pay for my own stuff. I'm going to manage my own life. This is the life I want to live. So I'm going to do it. And then when we see that someone in who claims to love us is taking this time from us and not valuing our energy, it's like embarrassing. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like, you know, I've got a feminist husband, but I keep trying, it's not working the way I want it to work. And so instead I'm just going to be a strong, independent woman. And I'm going to make this work. And you end up so resentful. And Eve Rodsky says she did the, exactly the same thing. The should I do list. Mm-hmm. And I basically did the same thing a couple of years ago. And I was like, you don't see what I'm doing. You think you're helping but I don't want to, I want to help you. I want to help you around the house. You tell me what to do and I'll help you. It's so that like, it's such an embarrassing issue. And the more I talk about this, even with friends who I thought had like super supportive, awesome husbands, they're like, no, I'm keeping it all together for us. Mm -hmm. I pack for him. If Mm -hmm. he doesn't do this, it doesn't get done. Yeah. It feels good to have it in the open. Yeah. And I want to, I want to say this, that this is definitely not an interview where like me and Laura are going to like bash men. I want to say, (laughs) no, men were taught this, like there were, you know, women. And again, we're, we're generalizing and, and genderizing. We were taught to take care of people and do all the tasks. And men were taught to receive the convenience of that. Mm Mm-hmm. So it's, it's not their fault, but it is their responsibility to change. Exactly. And I really, uh, my husband is actually a fair play certified facilitator with me. We both went through the training together and we have these conversations constantly, which are men. I feel, I feel like a lot of men are still taught that their main role is to be a financial provider. Mm -hmm. And so when women are taught all of these different ways to show up for each other and to bond and be intimate. 
And so many men are robbed from that, that knowledge and even taught that the only way that they can be relational to women is in a romantic way. Right. Usually through sex. (laughs) Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so how do we, it's work. It's, it's real work to undo that and, and step into a role at home where it's like, no, cleaning up the dishes means you value me. That is a gift to seeing who I am. Yes. And, and I, I forgot to mention the, the, the thing that, that I did that was really unhealthy when I made the list and I, and I was so resentful and that's not a good place to come at a, an important conversation. And I, I don't remember where I yelled it in the conversation, but I said, have we ever, ever run out of toilet paper? Ever. Can you Uh ever remember a time in our relationship, even before we had children that we have ever run out of toilet paper and had to use paper towels or tissues? No. Do you think that the toilet paper (laughs) just brings it? And I, and I use that as an example. And I said, I'm always thinking about the inventory of our house, paper goods, kids, socks, and underwear, dog food, Mm -hmm. (laughs) food in the pantry. I know all of that information and kind of switching gears, but it's directly related. I recently did some continuing education for my coaching certification and it was on brain science. And he was talking about how our executive functioning is like a cell phone battery and we only have a a certain amount, you know, it's not, it's not this bottomless pit of, of energy of mental energy. And he was naming all of the things that cause battery drainage. And it was all of the things that that women typically do. It's wow. the decision making. Uh-huh. It's the um moving from task to task. It's the it's that mental load that you talked about of of having to take care of so many things and also we tend to be multitaskers which is actually not that efficient. Right. And right. Extremely so mentally draining. Before like I just like go on and on about my own woes. <laughs> <laughs> So for those that might be, that might feel uneasy about opening a discussion about fairness and domestic responsibilities in their relationship, or even, even at work, and I'm, I'm assuming it's slightly different, you know, conversations. Mm -hmm. Um, what advice do you have? Like, where's a good place to start? I think that the, the first place to start is valuing your own time. Um, you can't, it's, it's about boundaries, right? You're saying no to things that don't serve you. You're saying, no, I'm not going to carry the whole entire family here. I'm not going to create the life for all of us so that you can say yes to being less resentful so that you can say yes to um, what Eve calls unicorn space, but is like sanity space, like clear mind space, permission to be unavailable to your roles at work as a partner, as a parent. Um where you're just not responsible for other people. And when you can value your own time and see that your time and energy are finite, like you said, you only have so much of a, of a battery. You have 24 hours. How much of that are you going to give away Mm -hmm. and for how long? And I think once you can talk yourself into that and do whatever it takes, if that means 20 minutes and then like, get the wedge in there until you have an hour a week or two hours a week to yourself protected. It empowers you to see what that feels like Mm -hmm. when you have that space, you can be like, you know what? I like this. Yeah. This is important to me. My time is valuable. My interests, my friendships are so valuable for me. That clarity is what empowered me to come to my partner and say, you know, this, this is the life I want to live. And I want to live it with you. I chose you for a reason. I want to see us show up as whole people and actively together. Because right now, I feel like a lot of people in this unequal balance at home are living parallel lives. Yeah. Or they're facilitating for their partner. Everything is transactional. and mm -hmm. Yeah. It starts with yourself. Okay. First, before you say, I heard these two women yelling on a podcast about how you don't do enough around the house. Say that right. too. <laughs> right, right. And and what it is for me, um, it goes back to what I said about I've said it a million times. I'll say it a million times until it's heard. Men round themselves down when they don't think their active participation at home is important. Because 
it's a legacy. It's connecting with your family. It's showing your loved ones that their time matters. Mm -hmm. It's not just, uh, I can't remember the author's name now, but he says, I got divorced over dishes. Incredible author. But he says like, you know, I would leave the dishes in the sink over and over and it it's not valuing my partner's time. And that and sends that, a message. Mm-hmm. It does. And it ends marriages. You don't want that. I'm interrupting this conversation to bring you a few words from some of our sponsors. If you really, really know me, you know I love a beautiful serving bowl and serving dish. My mom had this big serving dish since I was a kid, and it has a crack in it that's been repaired. And a few years ago, when I was at her house for Thanksgiving, I asked her if I could have it, and she gave it to me. I don't know. Dishes, especially serving dishes, create so much meaning, and I can't wait to hand down to my kids special dinnerware that we use now. Because your table is where you nourish yourself, your friendships, and your family, and that's why year and day believes it's worth it to set a table you love. Year and Day gives you everything you need and nothing you don't to set the perfect table. I love, love, love the simplicity and beauty of Year and Day's designs. This isn't your grandma's china. It's a beautifully curated assortment of high quality dishes, flatware, and glass designed to enhance your modern life at home. And if you're not sure what you want, you can answer a few questions about how you live, how you entertain, and year and day will customize a complete set for you in just a few clicks. And this is very important. Everything is dishwasher safe. I think they're gorgeous. Please go check them out and support the show. Year and Day is giving Make Some Noise listeners a special offer. Visit yearandday.com slash noise and use code noise to get $25 off your first order of $150 or more and receive free shipping on orders of $150 or more. That is yearandday.com slash noise and use code noise. All of their things are beautiful. Go check them out. I especially love all of their bowls. So again, yearandday.com slash noise and use code noise. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. People don't always realize that physical symptoms like headaches, teeth grinding, digestive issues can be indicators of stress, not to mention doom scrolling. That is something that I do that I wish I did not do as much as I do. Sleeping too little, sleeping too much, under eating, overeating. For me, for sure, insomnia is one of my biggest indicators of stress. It can show up in all kinds of ways. And in a world that's telling us to do more, to hustle more, sleep less, you know, where it's celebrated if you sleep less and grind all the time, I am here to remind you to take care of yourself, do less, and hopefully try some therapy. Therapy has been incredibly helpful for me. I have long told you guys on this podcast that I am pretty much always seeing a therapist, especially in times of of extra stress. So BetterHelp is customized online therapy. They offer video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy. Give it a try and see if online therapy can help lower your stress. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and Make Some Noise listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash kickass. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash kickass. I have two things that I want to ask you about that I'm sure are arguments that you hear a lot. And the first one is... What do you say when men push back and say, um, but I work 40 plus hours a week. I bring home a great salary. My wife uh, stays home. We made that decision. She enjoys it. She's good at being the mom. That's her job. And my job is at the office and I come home and I don't want to do extra tasks and extra work. That's, That's on her. So what do you say to that argument? I have a couple things to say to that. I Thank bet you, you do, asking. Laura. <laughs> <laughs> I've um, heard them on TikTok. Tell us. Yeah. <laughs> Number one, everyone deserves equal rest. Mm-hmm. If you take nothing away from, from the messaging I'm trying to get out there, it's that everyone deserves equal space and time for their own fulfillment. Um, and that's not going to Target and that's not taking a bath. That's creative pursuits. That's building community. That's real fill your bucket time. Mm -hmm. 
And, and that just bleeds over into so much more joy elsewhere. But also there are tasks, like I can't cook dinner and put my kids to bed in the eight hours earlier in the day. Mm -hmm. There are so many other things that happen outside of that 40 hours. So if you and your spouse split it up and, and you're like, okay, that's her job during the day. And that's my job during the day. Then it's only fair to participate actively during the rest of the time. Mm -hmm. Your fair is not my fair. It's not about 50, 50. It's about finding something that feels equitable. And also domestic labor is labor and she's working all day too. So like, right. let's just get that out of the way. <laughs> One of the things, I mean, this just happened the other night and my husband and I have worked hard on this and it's, it's not done by any stretch. Like we still have to have like meetings, ongoing meetings about it. And we still have a lot of old gender stuff that we grew up, uh, you know, I'm a Gen Xer. So is he like, we we've had to have very frank conversations about like, what do you, what do you expect? And I had mm -hmm. to, I had to be unattached and like not be mad when, when he's like, this is what I grew up thinking was right. So yeah, there's that. And I, the other night, my daughter came into our room and she asked me a question. I had that realization that I have a lot of times that probably 80 to 85% of the time they ask me, my, ch my children ask me when my husband is sitting right there and even they will, my children will go out of their way to come <sighs> and ask me something when they're sitting right next to their father. It's just become, because I've always been the primary caregiver. Mm -hmm. Even though my husband, he would, he'd go back to work, but he spent two years stay, being the stay at home parent. So I, I say that anecdote because, I mean, I don't know if your family's like this, but still we have to constantly remind, I have to constantly remind my children, like there's another parent who's capable of making those decisions. I never knew how exhausting decision-making could be until I had children. How old are your children? They're 14 and 12 now. Yeah. What do you do in that circumstance? You mean when she comes in the room and asks yeah. if she can have a snack because it's like 9 30? Yeah. Sometimes if I'm really tired, I will say mom's clocked out. Dad, dad answers all questions. Or I'll say, like, I'm not answering any questions. Yeah. And and I think it might seem like well, you just spoke words. Like what difference right. does it make for you to say, I'm not answering any more questions versus yes or no to the snack question. Mm -hmm. A couple of things. I'm sending a message. Like I'm trying to teach and train and like, I'm, I'm drawing a line of like, no, this, some changes need to be made, which I guess is kind of the same thing, but um, that's what I do. The other argument I wanted to ask you about was women who, um, who really like being, you know, having that role of the stay at home mother, they are fulfilled by it. They, um, get a lot of joy from caretaking. And I, I'm sure you get pushed back on that of like, mm -hmm. but this is what I want to do. Yeah. And, and obviously that's wonderful. As long as you feel comfortable in your partnership and you feel empowered and you feel like you have the same autonomy. I think that's the thing. That's the thing that I've come to realize is that Unfortunately, due to the way our society is structured, you are not free unless you are financially free. Mm -hmm. And I've heard a couple of great su suggestions like having having time compensated if possible to have your own savings account just so that you have discretionary funds. It doesn't have to be a point of contention at home. It can just be like I don't want to have to ask you because asking for permission to spend money and asking for permission it sets up this power dynamic and it messes with that, that equality and that, that equity at home. So mm -hmm. I feel like as long as you feel empowered and I've been talking about it a lot lately, which is this issue of not being able to walk out the door without leaving instructions. Oh yeah. So I really like fair play because one of the main ideas is that each partner at least has a chance to hold, they call them, you know, hold the whole card experience from conception to execution, each of the daily grind tasks, both partners feel empowered. A couple of years ago, when my daughter was very young, I felt really anxious leaving the house. And, and that was on me to really start valuing my time and stepping away and empowering my husband to be a full caregiver. 
And now I'm like, Hey, I've got something Saturday. I put it on the calendar. Are you home? And he'll be like, yeah, I got it. I can walk out the house. I know we've just, dis- we've established what a weekend lunch looks like. We both know the schedule. So I feel autonomous. I have agency. I can do the things I need to do with my life. And I, I don't feel trapped. Yeah. So as long as you don't feel trapped, good for you. But if you do feel mm-hmm. trapped, I feel like that's a, it's kind of a red flag that something needs to change. And thankfully mm-hmm. there are tools out there. Yeah. I, I often think about in situations where, you know, in a heterosexual relationship where, especially where there are children and a woman is happy being the stay-at-home parent and, and having that, that role. And it's a terrible thing to have to think about, but I've thought about like, well, what would happen? Cause I was in a, in a marriage before we did not have children, but he was unfaithful. And I'm like, well, what would happen if that happened now? Mm-hmm. Would I be in a place where I could walk away and be financially secure or would it be super complicated? And I would have to rely on someone like, do I know what's going on with the finances? And that, that's a whole nother conversation for another, for another time, I, but a very important one. Yeah. But I want to, I want to ask you because you mentioned the cards and, and I don't think that we've explained that. So there's the book, the fair mm-hmm. play book, and then there's a deck of cards, correct? Is that how yes. people kind of figure out and divvy up all of the tasks in the home? Yeah. So there are 100 cards and it covers most of the household tasks. Um, And 10 of them are wild cards. Like I had a baby or my parent is sick. Mm -hmm. Um, 60 of them are for couples only. And then there are an an additional 40 that come into play if you have kids. So it's really applicable in many situations, not as good for work. Okay. But you know, the, the framework works for your career. Okay. And I have so many questions. (laughs) All right. (laughs) (laughs) I might have answers. Okay. Well, let me ask, let me ask you this for Mm -hmm. women balancing a job outside of the home, Mm -hmm. they are working mothers and they're trying to balance and also run their household. Are there any words you might want to share with them now? That would be that your time matters, that your Mm -hmm. time is finite. Just hearing that, like if, if you're in a, in a hat, a heterosexual partnership, would anyone ever call them a working dad or like no. a dad who's balancing work and life? It, mm-hmm. It's much rarer to hear that. Um, and it should be, it should be both of you balancing work and life. So it, it feels hard to set that boundary around your time. And I hear a lot of women saying like, oh, but if I walk out of the door, my kids are going to cry or mm-hmm. um, I'm going to feel really guilty. And I, I hope there are people out there like you with your book and your podcast and people like us on TikTok who can be the little whisper in your ear, like, it's okay. It's okay. Take your time. Mm-hmm. You can not do it all. You can, yeah. <laughs> you can put some stuff down. You can share. Yeah. I don't know if you feel this way, but like, I, cause I get asked on a fairly regular basis. Like how do I deal with mom guilt as being like a a working parent? And I think even, even if there's a mother out there who doesn't work, like going on a girl's trip Mm -hmm. or, you know, and and being away from her children, um, this might be like the most terrible answer, but I've kind of just accepted that it's part of motherhood. Like we just biologically, we, um, feel, there was, there was this documentary I was watching about, uh, about Bethany Hamilton, the woman who, um, got her arm bit off by a shark, the Mm. professional surfer. Mm -hmm. And she, she was competing right after she had had a baby. And I think her baby was, he was like five months old, her first baby. And she was competing and she did not do very well. And she came out of the water and she was either being interviewed or talking to her husband. And, but she said, I could not stop thinking about him. And she was thinking about her baby Mm -hmm. and it was distracting and she didn't do as she didn't perform as well. And, and I was telling my husband, I was like, that's biological, especially when they're that little, 
it's, it becomes like our entire world. Oh, yeah. So I, and I have no, ev- so no scientific evidence to back this, <laughs> but I just think that the guilt is a form of us, of nature ensuring that we are going to take care of our children. <laughs> We're not just going to leave. You know, I know it does happen in rare instances, but I don't know. What do you think about that with guilt? That's a really interesting. That's Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You don't hear dads talk about that that often. I think unless I did see another documentary about, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, I think that this is important yeah. for, you know, for queer couple, couples that they have studied gay men who have adopted, who are coupled, who have adopted babies, and they tend to have the same amount of oxytocin hormones that new mothers do. So I, I do think that men can have the same feeling, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but it, they typically don't because they're not as, they're not as much the primary caregiver as the mother is. That's really interesting. Well, uh, I'll be super honest with you. I mean, that's been a huge hurdle for me and uh, mine are five and two, and I'm going mm-hmm. on my first overnight away from them in two weeks. The only time I've spent time away from the oldest was when I was in the hospital with the youngest. So I need your wisdom. That's about how old mine I, were when I when I left. Tell me, the first time. give me the wisdom. I need to, what do I do? How do I talk myself off the ledge? <laughs> I just accepted and embraced the guilt. Mm-hmm. I think the hardest part though was part of the reason that I left was because I was trying to wean my two and a half year old daughter because I was still nursing and I was done. Yeah. <laughs> She was at the point where she was like doing gymnastics, Mm -hmm. you know, and I was just a pacifier. I don't even know if I had any milk at that point, but the coming home was hard because she was mad at me. Like she was, and I, and I know that this probably isn't helping. (laughs) However, no, it's okay. It's okay. I just talk about the reality of things. I, she did get over it. Okay, good. And it might've been a little, a little traumatizing for her, but I just have accepted that my mental health and my emotional well-being matters. Mm-hmm. And I am not going to self-sacrifice completely. For, I, I We sacrifice so much yeah. as caretakers anyway. There are going to be times when I do things that are going to be a little upsetting to them. Yeah, I can't be all things to all people. What is your support for that? Like I hear so many women saying, you know, well, my mother-in-law is the one who's like, oh, you're going to leave the babies at home with him. It's these outside voices. Like how do you have support or or friends who gas you up? For sure. And that's one of the things that I'm incredibly blessed to have women who also feel the same way I do and and support me. Mm -hmm. And what that comment that you just made is I, and as much as uncomfortable as it is, I'm not saying that this is easy, but when people make those kind of passive aggressive remarks, I point it out Mm, mm -hmm. and I might say something like, I'm not motivated by guilt. Oh yeah. And sometimes, and I think that you've even made TikToks about this of just when you see videos of, or memes of men who are like joking about being terrible fathers, you know, it's like we, and we've made it this trope culturally, like, like, Oh, look at the dumb dad messed up again. Isn't that hilarious? Like, and just sort of like, like, why is that funny? Like why, you know, I might ask somebody who is passive aggressive, like, what do you mean by that? Like say more. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. In other words, like when, you know, when people are sarcastic, like ask them, like, what are you, what are you really trying to say? It will throw them for a loop. Oh man. I, you know, I'm such, <laughs> I know you're imagining saying it. To people I, yeah. Like, no. like I'm very, like you said at the top, you know, I'm, I'm very direct and I have, a, but these are like shower thoughts, you know, like, I'm much yeah. more nuanced in person. And I, I do these workshops and sometimes it's like deer in the headlights, men who have seen my videos and they're like, Oh no, she's going to rake she's coming after me. Yeah. Um, but I do always try to be thoughtful and, and for sure it, when I'm being direct, but oh my gosh, depends on the person. Absolutely. Well, here's, here's what I would, if it was like a mother-in-law or your own mom, or, you know, someone you, you are invested in the relationship, I might say something like this. And, and I, this would be like practice procrastinate, you yeah. know, <laughs> just, you've got to really prepare and say, I know that you care about us so much. And I love the way that you love my kids and you're always there for us. And I, I cannot tell you how grateful I am. And at the same time, 
we have chosen to parent this way and make decisions that I feel like you don't agree with. And it is deeply distressing to me when you make comments like that. And I, and I am going to politely ask that you don't make them anymore. That's great. I really appreciate that framework. Yeah, Yeah. I like that. And trust me, like I saying that, and then I would like go and have diarrhea. (laughs) It's like so nerve wracking, (laughs) but I just, and I, and I learned so much of my own communication from my best friend, Amy Smith, who has her own podcast. Those of you listening who don't know her, go listen to the podcast, but um, God, it's, it's tough and necessary. Yeah. I just finished um, Nedra Glover Tawab's uh, Set Boundaries, Find Peace. Mm-hmm. I've heard about it. I've heard it's Oh, great. it's so good. And she has an Instagram with like little nuggets of scripts and stuff like that. And I just think the biggest wisdom that she bestowed upon me has to do with this mental labor and this emotional labor stuff, which is like, like you said, like you can practice in a low stakes way. Like if somebody gets my order wrong when I'm at the coffee shop, instead of just like walking Mm -hmm. home with the wrong coffee, just being like, actually, uh, I ordered the tall, whatever, or going to Home Depot. And instead of walking around for 18 minutes, looking for something, just going up (laughs) to someone and being like, I'm looking for this. That's something I'm actually good at. Yeah. (laughs) It's, you know, it's like a way to respect your time and Mm -hmm. that tiny discomfort of uh, interrupting someone. That's always my thing. Feeling like we're bothering someone and they're actually doing their job. Exactly. It's such a low stakes yeah. way to practice that discomfort. Um, it's been so advice. helpful for me because I have yet to set those hard boundaries with family. It's hard. Oh, it's so hard. I totally, I'm like, I would totally be in the bathroom the rest of the day too. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. And I think that's why it's so important to preface it. And, and maybe this is helpful for people who are coupled or even at work when they're broaching the topic of, of fair play. Mm-hmm. And I, I, you know, when this is what Amy taught me, like, it's always a good idea to start with gratitude because nobody wants to listen when you're like, we need to talk. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's actual, like a physiological thing happens to our brains it's called flooding where all the, all the blood (laughs) leaves our executive functioning in the part where we can listen and make good decisions because we go into a little bit of panic. You know, our heart rate goes up, we get nervous and our body just goes into fight or flight and we can't help it. So set the foundation, start with kindness, make sure that the other person knows that you're here to, you're not here to fight. Mm -hmm. You're not here to tell them how wrong they are. (laughs) Yeah. You're not here to back them into a corner. You're here to tell them how much you appreciate their role in your life. And you're making a request. I That's such good advice. And it brings me back to your list, the should I do list. Like it makes sense that so many of us come to the table, like look at all of the things I'm doing and look at all the things you're doing. You're wrong. Mm-hmm. And they might be wrong. They might be wrong. And the advice I try to give to friends and the community at large is like you and I should have that conversation. And then you can come to your partner with a little bit of that edge taken off because not everyone needs to hear the whole story. Like you can get your needs met elsewhere and talking trash on how unfair Mm -hmm. this situation is might be better with a friend or your therapist or your therapist. Oh, everybody. You should be in therapy and you should be in couples therapy and they should be in therapy. (laughs) I I always tell people like if you're dating someone and they either make fun of therapy or say that they would never go run the other way. It's a huge red flag. (laughs) Great advice. Yeah. It's a huge red flag. I want to circle back to just emphasize that what you and I were talking about earlier, how this is not just to like blame and shame men and, and they, they really they really don't know. Cause even like going back to the, the list that I made it. And if you just look at it at face value, it just looks like a list of tasks. I mm-hmm. think what I never realized really, I think maybe until I started following you on social media was the space it was taking up in my mind of again, not just the task itself, but it's the constant running loop of all of those tasks. Mm-hmm. And you know, like there's like a, a, a meme that went around or a joke a few years ago that mostly shared by women. My brain is like a browser with 
132 <laughs> tabs open at all times. And my yeah. husband's has like one. Yeah. And, and that is my literal computer as well. Mm -hmm. But, um, but I, that's the part, even when I was so upset and exhausted that I didn't realize was taking up so much space and energy in my life. That's the part. And I say that because I think that's the part that really needs to be communicated to the person, whether it's at work or whether it's at home that does not have that role. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think my husband I first read Fair Play and then I brought the system to him and we didn't really implement it fully until he read the book. And instead of me sitting down and telling him all of the steps of laundry, he heard someone else's voice telling him and he was like, oh my gosh, I had no idea what you were doing. Mm -hmm. And I hear this from a lot of couples who come to me or even I get, I, you know what? I get a lot of DMs. I get husbands sliding into my DMs, just say thank you. And it feels so nice that like, I know it's frustrating that it's coming from another person and they're finally listening, especially if you've been saying this over and over again, mm -hmm. but just like, it, it's fine. Even my husband, I feel like I'm a great communicator, but my husband needed to hear someone else say it. Yeah. Um, and that's what I love is bringing the invisible labor out in the open. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for someone who is no matter what age they are, but they're single and they are looking for a relationship and they definitely don't want this to be a problem in their next relationship? Like, do they talk about this on the first date? Like, <laughs> where do you recommend this, this talk comes in? I, I've been thinking a lot about that question lately. Um, I think that doing some visualizing with them would be great. Like, what do you see? What do you picture a family looking like? What do you, when you look 10 years down the line and maybe it's not with me, but if you have like, what does it look like in your life? Where do you spend your time? Um, when things get overwhelming, what do you think is going to happen? And just leaving that open-ended and because I, I, I just don't think we talk about that. Like when we meet somebody that we love or that we have shared interests with, it's so easy to assume that your values align mm -hmm. and sitting down and talking that out, out loud is so, I wish I would have done that. I love my husband. We've been together 12 years, but even these days we're sitting down and talking about our values and they've changed. Yeah. They do tend to change. Mm -hmm. They shift, I think. Right. There's so many things I think, and even going into my second marriage that I didn't, that we didn't talk about that. I wish we would, and by some miracle, we've been able to work it out, but things like what's your relationship with debt? Um, oh yeah. What is your relationship with investing in retirement? What do you want to do when you're retired? I mean, even though it might be a long way away for some people, but you might have like a general sense, like what, and I think what I would also ask is especially heterosexual relationship. If I was talking to a man I was dating, it's like, what do you expect your evening is going to look like when you get home from work? Ooh, just curious. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. going to be like, oh shit. I feel like there's a right or wrong answer here. <laughs> well, you mentioned red flags for you. What have been green flags? I, for me, it's, it's when my husband will listen to my lived experience without pushing back or giving me like any, like, well, what about, or, mm -hmm. you know, I heard that, you know, just like no arguments, just listening. And, um, you know, I, you and I don't know each other that well, but like my previous serious relationships were like the definition of red flags. <laughs> oh, God. Uh huh. Like, oh, this guy is kind and he doesn't like stay out all night at bars doing drugs and drinking and cheating on me. I will marry you. <laughs> and uh -huh. not to say he has a lot of really great redeeming qualities. I think that the two of us, honestly, like the best thing that ever helped us was going to therapy fairly early on in our marriage to learn how to communicate and learning about John Gottman's four horsemen of the apocalypse and like how we show up in conflict, uh -huh. um, which we saw ourselves very quickly <laughs> coming up. We also have a system for when we have disagreements and when we have arguments that, that is based on John Gottman's work, uh, you know, cause I am the type who wants to, I'm an extrovert. So I like, let's talk about everything right here in the now. Tell me what uh -huh. you're feeling right now. Like, tell me 
I, I want to talk, 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 talk. And he needs time to process the argument, figure out how he feels about things and just sort of like decompress from the stress of it. Mm-hmm. So we have come up with a system that works for both of us. It's a compromise basically. So I say all that for anyone. And it doesn't matter if you are single or if you are in a new relationship or if you are have been married for 25 years. I still think communication is the absolute foundation and emotional regulation. Whew. That one's hard for me. And in, I'm going to add a little caveat. I always thought that I just had a really hard time with it. Um, with cause what? I would, uh, emotional regulation okay. for myself. And I did have a really hard time. I'd totally fly off the handle. And then I couldn't, I would like obsess and mm-hmm. couldn't let something go until we had it figured out in the moment. And I, it turns out that I had a chemical imbalance in my brain. And once I got a <laughs> diagnosis and some help with that, it has made our, and, you know, couples counseling to learn exactly that the Gottman, it, all of the Gottman stuff yes, is great, the method. but yeah. So if you're having an, an extra hard time regulating yourself, go see someone, go like see I someone. said, like we both mm-hmm. said, get a therapist, <laughs> get a therapist. Yes. Say what's going on. Talk about your yeah. symptoms. Well, okay. This has been so helpful. And, and just one last question, just about the the, the book and everything. And I know you do workshops and um, like webinars, I think you do. And we'll put all those in, in the show notes. And do you, do you see people like on a consulting basis, like one-on-one a couple? I do. I can yeah. Say one-on-two. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I do. <laughs> Individuals and couples. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll put all that in the show notes, but do you recommend people starting with the book and should they get the deck of cards? It doesn't come together, right? You buy them separately. They're separate. Okay. I- I would recommend getting the book first and then you really need to read the book in order to lay a foundation for bringing the cards into play. And you don't need to buy the the deck. You can download it. I think you have to sign up for a newsletter online um, and they'll send you a copy of printable ones. Okay. So it's not, it's not incredibly necessary, but I know, especially if you have executive functioning challenges or just you love something tactile, it is a really nice thing to sit down on a Sunday for a half hour and sit with your partner and check in and trade mm-hmm. cards. But I think I've heard you say that if you only get the deck or print out all the cards, then it's, then you're just adding more tasks to do. Yeah. That's yeah. why you need to get the book. The, the book is really the instruction manual of, of why it works. Um, mm-hmm. Because if you come to it, it's just like bringing that list. It's just saying, here's all the things I do. Here are the things you do. And without the knowledge of how to communicate it, it could just turn into a huge fight. Okay. Because then one person ends up being the manager. Yep. Yep. And both of you don't necessarily need to read it. I do have a YouTube video with like a teeny tiny crash course on how to use it. Okay. So um, we'll I'm working. The show notes too. Yeah. I'm working on getting more content out. So it's, it's really digestible and I have a playlist on, on TikTok. Um, but I do, I really recommend the book. It's on okay. audio too. check, get your, go to your okay. library. Yeah. My people love audio books. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I, I really, I highly recommend that people follow you on, on social media. Um, I know you post a lot of your TikToks over on Instagram. So if someone's mm-hmm. not on TikTok, first of all, you should be, cause it's so fun. <laughs> so fun. <laughs> it's the really best. Fun. Is there anything else that you want to make sure that you say before we close that we didn't touch on or that you want to close up. It all boils down to valuing your own time and burning that guilt. Like you said, and make sure you have support and friends like us, yeah. put us mm-hmm. in your ears. We'll tell you. Yes, we will. <laughs> uh, and with that, thank you so much for, for your time today. Um, Laura's at that darn chat.com. All of those links will be in the show notes and I appreciate your time listeners so, so very much. I'm so grateful that you choose to spend it with um, me and my guests. And remember, it's our life's journey to make ourselves better humans and our life's responsibility to make the world a better place. Bye for now. Hi there. Swinging back by to say one more thing. You know how I'm always giving advice over here on the show and on social media. And a couple of those things is that I'm always telling you to ask for what you want, be clear about it, and also ask for help. So I am taking a dose of my own medicine and I'm going to do that right now. It would be the absolute best and mean the world to me if you reviewed and subscribed 
to this show, Make Some Noise Podcast, on whatever podcast platform of your choice. And even more importantly, it would matter so much if you shared this show. Sharing the show is one of the few ways the podcast can grow, and that also gives more women an opportunity to make some noise in their lives. You can do that by taking a screenshot when you're listening on your phone and sharing it in your Instagram or Facebook stories. If you're on Instagram, you can tag me at HeyAndreaOwen, and I try my best to always re-share those and give you a quick thank you DM. And also, you can tell your friends and family about it. Tell them what you learned. Tell them a really awesome guest that you found on the show that you started following. Whatever it is, I appreciate so much you sharing about this show. 